Hi, everybody. I both got some lunch and some coffee, so thank you guys. Um, my name's Chris McCann. Uh, oh, I can see right there. My name's Chris McCann, uh, as you mentioned, and I'm one of the founding partners of a fund called Proof of Capital. I'll give a short little intro about that in a second. But uh, today, the, the main topic of the talk is to really give you guys a crash course on, into the mining space. Um, I feel the mining sector is one of those uh, uh, sectors that's really sort of structurally important, but far, um, far fewer people really sort of pay attention to and really sort of fundamentally understand. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this, you'll, even if you know nothing about this, you'll at least have some kind of basic understanding of how the space works and looks and kind of how the industry operates. But before I start, a little bit about me. So again, my name is Chris McCann, uh, one of the founding and managing partners of a fund called Proof of Capital. Uh, before this, I used to work in a much bigger traditional venture capital fund called Greylock Partners. Uh, Greylock, if you're not familiar with Series A investors in Facebook, LinkedIn, Dropbox, Airbnb, a whole bunch of other companies, mostly on the consumer and enterprise uh, side. And then back in 2014-15, Greylock made three investments in the Bitcoin space. So we invested in Blockstream, Zappo, and Coinbase, all within that time frame. And long story short, I just really fell in love with the, the sector, and I left Greylock to, to do my own fund and focus on this space. On the one other, uh, sort of uh, on a personal basis, uh, I've been holding Bitcoin since 2013. I also was a pre-sale investor for Binance uh, and a bunch of other sort of companies in the space. And Proof of Capital, really briefly, we're a venture capital fund focused on the Bitcoin, crypto, and blockchain vertical. Um, we do a lot of investments cross-border, specifically both Silicon Valley and Asia. Uh, two of my other uh, founding partners with me is Edith Young, who used to be a GP at 500 Startups. Phil Chen, who used to be at Horizon Ventures, at Li Kaxing. Um, and we focus on a lot of the, call it more like company layer, that is really more around customers, use cases, adoption, uh, and that sort of side of the, 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 the space. And, and, and maybe one like more personal thing, like why, why I got interested into the mining space is when you look at the industries and verticals that are actually getting traction today, at least in my opinion, it's, it's basically the exchange space, financial infrastructure, trading, in mining, um, and, and so I, I, mining out of all those categories, mining was the one I, I had the least personal expertise in, and so I, I was really trying to understand it mostly for myself. So this is kind of a, an accumulation of all the, the, the research I did. Um, so the high top level thing, um, if you could take anything away from this, I'll, I'll give you one in the beginning and one at the end. Mining started off as this very hobbyist um, thing that, you know, back in 2010, 11, 12, you know, people could still do with CPUs and GPUs. It was mainly a um, kind of a, a, like a personal hobby type thing. On the left is a sort of decent representation of what that might look like. Um, and today, mining, particularly in the Bitcoin space, is a very industrial thing. So on the right, that's actually a picture of a real large-scale miner. I think that one's in Seattle. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale of how sort of built out some of these facilities are. Um, so mining is a much more professional occupation, and there's a lot more both institutional interest and sort of real infrastructure built out for this. Um, and so the high-level stat and why this, uh, why this space is so interesting just from a value capture standpoint. So the Bitcoin mining space alone on an annualized basis generates about $6 billion in annualized revenue. Again, as a high sort of top line number. Um, so uh, again, like I, I really, I really feel that, particularly in Silicon Valley, that like a lot of people don't really understand or appreciate the mining space as much. It tends to be mostly, uh, mostly located in Asia. So um, again, sort of for myself, like I went and met and became friends with a lot of the really sort of big large scale miners to really, really try to understand this space. Um, I won't go into too much technical detail, but uh, for, for people who might have never heard of, of Bitcoin mining before, so mining is essentially the way that new transactions are added onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So any proof of work mining also follows the same, uh, the same primitive too. Um, so no, no technical explanation, but a really good analogy, if, if you haven't heard this before, is proof of work mining is very similar to like a Sudoku type puzzle. It, it takes like a long time and it's very um, uh, sort of intellectually intensive to solve this thing. But once you've solved the puzzle, everybody else can verify it. And the person who gets to verify it gets to add the transactions onto the blockchain or onto the Bitcoin blockchain and get the reward in return. 
Um, so all this is basically just like a chain of blocks all chained together, and there's many, many computers and ASICs all doing these puzzles all at the same time. It's a very basic analogy. Um, and the benefits of all this mining activity and all these computers, I, I think a lot of people unfairly say it uses you know, too much energy or there's sort of a lot of concerns around this, but you know, all of this work is really going into making sure that when you, the user, submit a transaction onto the Bitcoin blockchain, it's confirmed on a timely manner. Uh, it's added into the correct order, which really protects against the double spends or people taking your money. Um, and then that history would also stay intact. So if anybody goes to look at that transaction or sort of see the past ones, there's a concrete record that you can point to, which the Bitcoin blockchain serves. So all these factors in general really make up all the settlement insur insurances. So if I send you like a $100,000 transaction that I could be sure and you can be sure without us trusting each other that that was sent and now it is in your possession. So all of this proof of work stuff and all of this mining stuff, at the end of the day, this is what it's all building towards. Um, just a sort of a, a, a sort of quick run through so some of the underlying hardware that's used in, in the Bitcoin space. Again, as I mentioned, when it was more of a uh, of a hobbyist thing, a lot of people were just using their CPUs. Um, that's like just the, the the chip that's in like a normal computer or laptop or anything uh, for a lot of this. Um, then when it's got a little bit, um, when the, 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 the work became a little bit harder, people moved to GPUs. Um, so these are typically the chips that are in your computer. If you have like a gaming computer, you know, if you have anything that processes lots of graphics, there's like a specific uh, GPU chip that's used for a lot of those activities. Um, one step higher than that, there's things called FPG, FPGAs. Uh, these are essentially programmatable um, uh, chips that you can use sort of for different al algos and logarithms by, uh, by coding these things called bit streams. And then last but not least, there's ASIC, so uh, application-specific integrated circuits. These are computers that are designed to do one and one thing only. So uh, I guess most notably in the Bitcoin space, there are computers that all they do is SHA-256 proof-of-work mining. Like there's no other uses for them. Their, their entire sort of, sort of sole existence and purpose is to just, um, just do the hashing function. And at least in the Bitcoin space, most of the large miners, it's all basically ASIC miners, ASIC mining. You can still do stuff with some, uh, some GPU things for a lot of the, the, the memory hard things. So think like ETH hash or any of that sort of stuff. But a lot of things on the Bitcoin side have all moved kind of up the stack. And I'll go through sort of in detail all this, but this is just a sort of high level view of the, the mining ecosystem in its totality from the underlying foundries to the manufacturers who build it, to the actual miners themselves, to the pools and some of the cloud mining stuff. I'll walk through sort of each of these um, sort of different players in the ecosystem, but in, in totality, this is a sort of a brief snapshot and window, window into the mining ecosystem. So from a hardware perspective, again, I'll, I'll do a high-level overview of this. There's the fabless IC designers. So these are typically, these would be like your, you know, the bit mains, Canons of the world. They are the ones that design the chips, but they're not the end ones that are actually producing them. That's why they're called fabless. They're not in the fabrication of it, just the designing of it. The design then gets sent to the underlying foundry. Um, so these are like the TSMCs of the world that actually produce the chip itself. And then that sense are called packaging and testing. So they actually like chop up the chips, put it into the thing, test them all, um, and make sure it, sort of everything, all the assembly works. Then it, then it goes through a, a sort of a series of different uh, assemblies and testing and all that and, and until it gets to you, the end consumer. So in terms of the underlying foundry, so the ones actually, the ones making these chipsets, there's basically two foundries in the world that can really do um, ASIC chip, ASIC chip foundry, foundry production. Uh, there's basically Samsung and TSMC. And TSMC, by and large, is the, the much bigger one in the space. Um, so when you look at, you know, even on the GPU side from NVIDIA to AMD to Xilinx to, and then on the ASIC side, so the Bitmains, Canons of the world, most of them all use TSMC for all of their core, uh, core production. TSMC is located in Taiwan, uh, and in Taiwan there's a lot of uh, um, sort of expertise and market share for chip design. Uh, packaging and testing, I'll, I'll do really briefly. One of the biggest companies in the space is called the ASE Group, which is also based in Taiwan. Uh, so after it's produced, it's sent to these companies, and they're the ones that do all the assembly and sort of testing of this. 
Uh, in terms of the, the manufacturers on the GPU side, you guys have probably heard of NVIDIA. They're the sort of 70 to 80% market share on the GPU side. And then uh, more notably on the ASIC side, uh, there's basically three large providers, Bitmain, Kanan, and What's Miner. Um, trying to get their market share is uh, not an easy task, but uh, sort of taking a... Uh, an average of all the sort of values and talking to people out there, the best sort of summation is Bitmain has about a 40 to 50% market share, Kanan's about a 20% market share, and What's Miner is about a 20%, 10 to 20% market share as well. Um, it's also sort of interesting that Kanan's, uh, Kanan and Bitmain have both tried to file IPOs on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange before. Um, uh, they are most likely going to go on to the NASDAQ Stock Exchange soon, and it's probably going to be Kanan first. Um, so it's just sort of worthwhile to kind of contextually put in space in the space and sort of uh, where this company is coming from. Um, so after the chips have been produced, the people who actually buy these in mines, they are the end miners themselves, the miners or mining farms, um, whatever you'd like to call them. Uh, so th they range in sizes. So there's, you know, there's definitely people who are still doing, you know, small scale machines, five to, you know, to 50 to 100 type ones. And there's some miners that are doing more large-scale stuff. So call it, you know, a thousand machines to, you know, I've seen some farms that are in the hundreds of thousands to machine-type levels um, that look more like the initial picture I showed. Um, so, so again, there's a sort of spectrum across this, but the more industrial-scale farms are more on the la later end of the spectrum. Uh, and again, a, a thing just to point out, uh, which is sort of an interesting thing in this space, some of the manufacturers themselves also do some self-mining. Um, Bitmain is probably the, 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 the most notable one. Uh, they actually publicly disclose some of their self-mining. There's a lot of controversy and questions around this, but it, it's just something to highlight, at least while I was talking about this. Um, and then there's the, the, the mining pools. Um, so a lot of people always quote the mining pools when they show the centralization in the space, which is a little odd because the pools aren't the ones doing the mining. They're just the ones that are aggregating a lot of the hash rate. To, to give an analogy to really understand what a mining pool is, uh, a mining pool is sort of like an office lottery pool. So you individually, you can buy your own sort of tickets and hope you win like this big lottery. Or what you can do is you can kind of go in with a whole bunch of other people and you know, whatever prizes are won in the pool, all of those are split between the participants. So it tends to smooth out the returns over time instead of just having it be very lumpy. So even some of the larger miners, when you're talking about 1,000 machines, most of those aren't, you know, they're not actually um, mining themselves per se. They're typically sending their hash rate to one of these uh, larger pools like Ant Pool or F2 Pool or Slush, slush Pool or Spark Pool. Um, and those are the ones that are actually aggregating all the hash rates together and sort of paying out the returns. And for the service, most of these pools typically take somewhere between 1% to 5% of all the rewards in the system. And one of the biggest, I guess, like concerns or, or sort of big questions in the space is you effectively have to trust the pool to report the correct numbers because your earning is based on what they're saying. Very similar to like a lottery pool, like if you give all your lottery tickets to your one coworker, you have to make sure that the coworker is reporting the rewards correctly because the rewards that you get is dependent on that person. Um, so th there are like companies in, in services and data and you know people also trying to bring more transparency to this market as well. But the one thing to highlight when, when, whenever anybody tries to show the centralization of the space, they always show the, the mining pools, but that's just kind of like the, the aggregate surface level. That doesn't actually show where the miners are. Just something to, 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 to sort of know about when, when you see some of those things being thrown around. Um, now this is some of the more like products and services kind of around the space. There's these things called hash rate marketplaces with NiceHash being one of the bigger ones. So as a miner, you have the option to you know, buy the equipment and do all the mining yourself. Or what you could do is you could just buy the hash rate directly and then self-mine with the hash rate itself. Um, so people also buy, sell, trade, sort of speculate on the, uh, on the underlying hash rate rate itself. And, and I was also trying to understand why people would do this as opposed to just you know, buying the machines and doing it, the, doing it themselves. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why is buying the hash rate is kind of the, uh, it's, a, it's a backdoor fiat entrance into crypto. So if you, can't, if you can't buy Bitcoin in your local country for whatever reason, 
Another option you have is you could buy the hash rate, which essentially converts into Bitcoin and sort of gets, you, gets your fiat in, into the crypto space without directly going through an exchange. Just sort of a fascinating thing about one of these things. Um, cloud mining is kind of similar, but instead of it being this marketplace, it's being sold by one supplier. Um, so there's, a, in the States, the, one of the biggest ones called Genesis. Uh, in Asia, one of the bigger ones is called um, uh, um, BitDeer. Um, so with these ones, you buy your hash rate, but it's not coming from sort of other people. It's coming from one supplier. So for BitDeer, Bitmain runs it. So when you buy your hash rate, you're essentially buying your hash rate from Bitmain itself. I think this last one, uh, the, this last category, which is a sort of a, a newer and interesting category called Smart Miner. Um, one example of it, one of my friends runs this company called Honey Miner, which actually was recently, um, uh, recently acquired, which is also interesting as well. Um, so Honey Miner uh, and these smart miners in general, what they do is instead of you, the miner, having to worry about a lot of the technical complexity of like what to mine and when to mine and sort of setting up all this stuff, they will essentially take care of all, all this for you. Uh, it tends to work better not necessarily on Bitcoin ASIC stuff, but if you do anything around GPUs or F GPAs, you sort of have multiple uh, choices and all things to do. So they optimize this to help you optimize the, the, the revenue and profitability of your miners. Um, and this last, pa last part, which I will try to end in four minutes, um, is really trying to understand the, the size and sort of the, the mindset of some of these miners. So as I mentioned at the top, on an annualized basis, Bitcoin generates about $6 billion annually um, for the mining space as a whole. That's on the right side. Um, and these numbers were from June 25th, 2019, which are a little bit old, which I'll get to back to in a second. Um, and then uh, for all the other uh, cryptocurrencies out there, these are the same numbers for them uh, uh, in its totality. So as you can see, like I think a lot of people get really excited about, you know, uh, sort of staking and new networks and new proof of, proof, of, proof of stake and proof of work type stuff. But again, if you look at what, where the revenue is actually being generated, it's still very much on the, the Bitcoin side. One sort of example, just to sort of help you get, in your, get into the head of one of these miners, uh, if you wanted to set up your own uh, um, uh, mining operation, the two main costs you have to worry about is basically CapEx and OpEx. So your main capital expenditures are buying the equipment itself, buying the facility, doing the import tax, kind of all the, all the stuff that you can depreciate over time. Uh, and then your main operational expenditures is basically energy. You also have people and security, but energy is really the biggest cost. And, and so one of the other things is a lot of these miners also scour the world to try to find the cheapest form of energy, because that's really one of their major costs. And then their revenue is basically generated from the rewards uh, uh, from how many blocks they can solve. Um, I'll, I'll get back to this in, in, in one second, but at the time that I, I wrote this, uh, for all of this, uh, all these machines, that would be your revenue potential. But actually, when you look today, that number was cut in about half. And I'll explain why uh, sort of after this. And a big reason why is there's a lot of factors you can control, like what machines you use and where they are and how much your energy costs. But from a miner's perspective, there's a lot of these market factors which affect your profitability much more than what you can control. Um, so to talk about a few of these things quickly, um, one, uh, very differently than most other products, the, the manufacturers that sell these ASIC hardware machines, they actually don't have a fixed price. The price is actually variable, dependent on the price of the underlying cryptocurrency. Um, so you, you normally don't have floating prices for products, but since these things actually generate crypto, the price is actually not denominated, but it, it's kind of uh, in relation to the underlying crypto itself. Um, uh, and then secondly, uh, you as the miner, you're competing not just with yourself and with Bitcoin, but with all the other miners. So the more miners there are and the more hash rate there is, the, the, less, um, uh, uh, the less market share you have, uh, which I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. And then the, the biggest impending question that most miners have to think about is the supply schedule, um, which I'll highlight in a second as well. Um, so from when I wrote the post to today, 
the price of Bitcoin has stayed sort of about the same. I think it was a little over 10,000. Now, now it's kind of hovering around the nine to 10,000 ish area. So the price itself didn't move that much. And so the rewards didn't change all that much in the middle of when I wrote it till today. However, the big thing that changed was the hash rate. So this is basically the accumulated hash rate of all of the other miners in the Bitcoin space. And between when I wrote the post to today, it's almost gotten almost two times more expensive. So even if I had the same 10,000 machines and even if the price hasn't moved that much, it's actually become more difficult in terms of hash rate difficulty. And so all factors alone, my profitability would fall by half or my revenue would fall by half, not because the reward fell by half, but because it's more competitive of a space. Um, so it's just one example of like a market factor you as the miner have to worry about. And then the biggest impending um, uh, strategic question that all miners have to, are going to have to deal with is the upcoming halving event. So a halving event, really briefly, is the, the rate of reward in the Bitcoin network goes, is going to go down by half sometime in about mid-2020. And so if all else stays the same, your profitability will drop by half no matter what you do. And so how you play this and how it sort of works and how the market reacts to this is like one of the most important factors. No trading advice, but every other happening event has seen sort of a significant upswing up. Um, so also people on the trading side are trying to play this, but this is kind of the biggest impending question for most miners. One last takeaway, and I know I'm slightly over time, but um, like while this space is really over, uh, uh, under, underlooked and sort of, uh, um, again, located mostly in Asia, I think it's just a really structurally important to really pay attention to because mining at the end of the day provides a lot of the security guarantees that we as users uh, rely upon. And then my, my, second big, my, my first biggest takeaway is the mining space is moving to be much more industrialized. The second biggest high-level takeaway is hash rate equals the underlying cryptocurrency, which if you believe in the cryptocurrency, equals money. And so hash rate really is the money. And so what a lot of people do, and why I think this is so important in Asia, is because a lot of people actually use hash rate almost as like the fiat on-ramp or fiat rails into the space. And so I think that's also another reason why to treat like hash rate almost as like a first class citizen to the underlying crypto itself. Because at the end of the day, they're sort of one in the same. Um, and so last thing, uh, if anybody here is like working on anything in the mining space, like we're super interested in this category, we'd love to talk to you guys. Um, I also write a, 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 a newsletter called RelayNode, RelayNode.io, you can you could sign up. Uh, we cover different uh, ecosystems all around the world, a lot of the events and conferences and things going on. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you're doing anything in the space, and thanks for the time. <laughs>